All right, Dad, good morning. Today is Monday, September 30th, and a lot's happened over the weekend. Um, every day we got a lot of news rolling in. Um, on our last podcast, we were just talking about Hassan Nasrallah, and we didn't know if he was killed or not. But shortly after we did the podcast, we got confirmation that Hassan Nasrallah was indeed uh, assassinated, uh, killed in the strike in Beirut. Um, but before we talk too much about the implications of his death, could you tell us a little bit about just who is Hassan Nasrallah? Because I realize that I really don't know much about him. So can okay. you first tell us who he is and how big of a figure he was? Yeah. Well, I can't give you a very detailed biography, but I, again, I can give you a sketch. Um, he wasn't the, the first re, uh, leader of Hezbollah. Right, maybe we just go back and repeat that Hezbollah is an organization that did not exist prior to the Israeli invasion in 1982. Uh, when they invaded uh, Lebanon in 1982, uh, there were many Shia living in the south. Um, and they actually, in general, viewed the uh, Israelis in a positive light. You know, it's amazing to be seen. They, Israel back then had many more friends in Lebanon than it does now. But as a result of its, its invasion and then the ensuing occupation, it made enemies. And one of those enemies, you know, were the, the Shia, the, who are uh, predominantly found in southern Lebanon. Um, and they formed an organization, an organization to resist the Israeli occupation, and that was Hezbollah. Now, the first leader, his name escapes me, um, but he was assassinated by a helicopter strike carried out by the Israelis during the 1990s. And the replacement, the man who replaced him, was Nasrallah, um, who has been um, the the head of Hezbollah you know, ever since, so for approximately 30 years. Um, he's a highly revered f figure, you know, within, you know, not just within the, the Shia community, but throughout much of Lebanon. You know, um, I, I'm, again, I, you know, I mentioned that Hezbollah is known as a protector of Christian communities, and the Christians have mourned this in Lebanon have mourned his passing, you know, the great majority of Christians anyway. Um, he was, he's always described as, you know, this is a ridiculous term terrorist, you know, which is just thrown at, at opponents of Israel, opponents of the U.S. They're all terrorists, right? That's a very convenient catch-all term. Uh, he, he was the head of, again, of Hezbollah, which is a civil and a military organization, just like a, it's a kind of a government within a government. The Shia were, uh, you know, actually a, among the poorer people living in Lebanon and often neglected by the Lebanese government. Um, and the Hezbollah, you know, not only protected them by resisting, you know, the, the Israeli occupation, but they also have been very effective in providing social ser services and just a sense of dignity to those people in southern Lebanon. Uh, so he is a civil, it's very important to remember, as well as a military leader. Um, there have been many assassination attempts on him in the past. This was not the first one. I think there were, like just during the, you know, during the occupation, there were several attempts to assassinate him. They all failed. So. He knew that there he was always um, living on borrowed times, so to speak. It's actually amazing that he survived so long. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I think that I hope that answers your question right there. More or less, can you tell me just a little bit? You said that the, the Shias used to look upon the Israelis favorably um, prior to 1982. If that's the case, why did what was the reasoning for Israel to invade southern Lebanon to begin with in 1982? They were after they were not after the Shia; they were after the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Um, that there were a number. Uh, the PLO had had camps in southern Lebanon, and the Israelis went after them. Now, one of the results was these terrible massacres, not carried out actually directly by the Israelis, uh, by, but by these Christian phala phalangist groups. At that time, you know, Christian they were- what? Uh, they were known as phalangist. I don't actually know where the term comes from, but phalangist, it was, a, you know, a certain, um, 
I don't know if it's proper to call them a sect, maybe a faction of Catholic Christianity within within um, Israel, and they were allied tightly with the with the Israelis. Um, and the Israelis let them in. They were both enemies of the PLO. There were a couple of refugee camps in southern Lebanon, uh, having you know, well thousands of, of Palestinian refugees in those camps. And the Israelis let them in, knowing that they were going to what they were going to do. They were going to commit massacres, and they <clears throat> they watched them commit the massacres. They killed, I believe, it was two thousand and one and two thousand and the other. You know, it's it either a total of four thousand or a total of two thousand. Wait, wait, so, you know. so who killed? The, so the the Christian, the whatever Phalanges. Phalanges killed the Palestinian refugees. Yes, they actually went in just you know. You know, mostly they're not fighters; they're just defenseless people. You know, old men, women, and children, and they just shot them point blank. You know, just killed them outright, just a, just a massacre, right? And the Israelis knew what was what was going to happen, knew what was happening. They let it happen. Um, so yeah, those are very different times in Lebanon. But if the Israelis overstated that, you know, they had it, it, Lebanon is a is what well, was and is a very divided society. It's a, it's a heterogeneous society with many different sects, you know, many different political factions. And at the time there were, you know, actually the, the, those factions that were allied with Israel were numerous um, and um, were considered, you know, were, were a force to be reckoned with. And Israel worked with them, I think maybe is one of the reasons they went in thinking that they had allies but the fact is, you know, they, they, of course, they, they killed a lot of civilians in the process. They occupied the land. They became the occupiers, and they turned much of the country, and especially the Shia, against them. And that's, you know, so now today you have, in general, Lebanon is much more solidly opposed to to uh, Israel, and and looks upon the the Shia and Hezbollah, you know, much more favorably than it once did. Um. But the fact is that it is still a divided society. You know, you know interestingly, I was listening to, actually, uh, it was an, ex or watching an extraordinary um, podcast. Um, I think it was, it's called Wartime Cafe. And I've never seen it before, but I knew both of the participants. The interviewer was, um, oh, I forget his name. You know, I've seen him on other shows. I think he's a Palestinian himself. But the man being interviewed, I'm very familiar with, is Mohammed Morandi, and the interview was taking place in uh, Beirut. And the, these are two, you know, these it, it is quite a moving podcast because they had been greatly affected by the recent events, and at times they they, they couldn't restrain their tears. Um, you know, these are not generally not very emotional men, but you know, obviously they've been greatly. Um, they, they were grieving for the the loss of Nasrallah and and just and all the recent casualties, but Mirandi he was just one kilometer away with a friend in a hotel, one kilometer away from the bunker where Nasrallah was when he was killed. And they you know they heard the explosions. It, it, it was they thought it was just next door because it was so loud and powerful. And after there went afterwards they went out and he saw this was a neighborhood he was familiar with. Mirandi was familiar with, and it was. A total shock. But the reason I bring them up, you know, I would recommend if you if you can find that. I think again, it's wartime cafe because it's just something. You know, often we we talk about these things. It almost seems sort of abstract, but these people were right there on the ground, and you know, are and while they were talking, they could even hear the drones overhead buzzing. Okay, I mean, I'll try to link it in the show notes. If yeah, I can find it. Um, but yeah, the reason I bring it up is that I think it was Mirandi who said that well, Beirut was always the weak link in uh, the axis of resistance, the weak, because it is so heterogeneous. There are a lot of Western, there's a lot of Western influence within Beirut, especially. And there always has been. Lebanon has been kind of, has always been a country within the Middle East that has had a, a particularly great number of connections with the West. So you do have, you know, certain sects, certain factions that are still hostile to Hezbollah and still allied with Israel. 
And then you have all these, you have a lot of Western intelligence. And so he said, if there was any place that, that uh, the access was going to be infiltrated, it would probably be Beirut. So it just, it makes sense to him that this has happened. But yeah, yeah, I, I remember last time we were talking about, or I was talking about the, the advantages that um, Hezbollah has over Hamas. And those advantages are very real, you know, just m m many, they just, you know, they have, they're, they're not under siege and they, you know, they have much more land. They have many more men under arms. They have many more resources and so on and so forth. Uh, but one disadvantage is that they are living in a heterogeneous society with a great deal of, that's subject to a lot of Western influence and each already has a lot of, you know, Western intelligence operating, you know, as opposed to Gaza, which is a, a large, almost entirely homogeneous society. Um, and so there, I, I think the Israelis found it impossible to, to infiltrate Hamas in any significant, meaningful way. But they clearly have done that um, to Hezbollah. And that's, I think, the big question right now. You know, they have been taking out, you know, uh, leader after leader. They, uh, even after they assassinated Nasrallah, they, uh, Nasrallah, they, they assassinated, um, I think, a day or two later, the head of the, like, internal security. I can't remember the exact title. So they were still finding these people. And so there's there's clearly some hole that um, Hezbollah needs to plug, desperately needs to plug. And if they can plug it, they can recover. And they can, you know, they can resist, as they've done in the past, a, a potential ground invasion, certainly. But if they can't, you know, we're going to continue to to see Israeli victories. Right. I was going to ask about that, um, just because it seems like the vast majority of Hezbollah's command structure has been taken out. I mean, yeah. it's um, a good part of it anyway. Yeah, a very important part of it. Yeah. So how, how do you think that's just going to impact the conflict um, in the in the short run and in the long run? Do you yeah. think that this will just cause will, enough and, chaos right. that there'll be a ground invasion yeah. or what? Yeah. Um, my guess, you know, my guess is that if it stops now, or you know, largely stops, if Israel, you know, if Hezbollah manages to identify the, you know, the, the leaks and plug them, that Hezbollah will recover rather quickly. Um, and, and will survive and, and, you know, and may ultimately succeed in their battle with Israel if Israel does in, uh, conduct a ground invasion. And to succeed, what does that mean? Just to survive and push the Israeli, make sure that the Israelis right. don't invade or just to have them stop bombing Beirut? I mean, what, what yeah. is success? Well, success would be, yeah, if Israel invades, um, and they may, um, to 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 defeat them and to push them back that would obviously be success another is to continue to apply pressure on the um on northern israel and to um to prevent israel from returning you know those residents of northern israel to their homes that would obviously be success too to maintain the pressure because and again they've always stated this in fact there was something that came out i believe it was actually nbc news that said, you know, this was quoting an Israeli intelligence officer um, saying that, well, the reason they decided to take him out was that he would not agree to a ceasefire, that is Nasrallah, to a ceasefire with Israel, a ceasefire between Hezbollah and Israel without there first being a ceasefire in Gaza. I mean, that was the stated purpose is that he wanted the genocide to end. And so that's really what he died for. Um, and so I th think they they want to maintain that pressure on on behalf of you know, the people of Gaza. Th that too will be success if they can do that. Uh, how significant is Nasrallah's death? Is this oh, going to have? Very, yeah, it's very significant. I mean, he was a high, of course, a highly revered figure um, in, of course, in in uh, Israel, but through much of the Muslim world, you know, especially the Shia world. And, um, you know, and very, very revered in Iran. Iran turned, they had a, there's a well-known pedestrian bridge in the heart of Tehran that they turned crimson. You know, they, they turned on these crimson lights. 
And they say that means that it, it, it's it's a symbol of revenge. You know, I don't know, but maybe that's what it is. Um, I think it it clearly um, shocked the new uh, Russian, uh, not Russian, but rather Iranian president, uh, Um I A lot of people were saying that he was just he was really rather naive, and he he, he made a statement. I th actually quite. I think quite extraordinary and quite explains a lot of things that are going on. Um, it, it was, it, I've seen it actually in many different places. It's clear that he made the statement, you know, there's no question about this, but he Talking said, about the Iranian president, the Press, Iranian Press president, okay. exactly. Um, he said that he had agreed to delay the retaliation. You know, we've been wondering why this retaliation to the assassination of Hania has taken so long. He said that he had agreed to because the Americans had promised that it, there would be a ceasefire in Gaza, and that's what at least what's, that's what all of the stories or these stories say. And then some add that also they had promised to lift sanctions, so at least some of the sanctions on Iran, yes. and that he would. Do it. But obviously, you know, this is what he got. So he was yeah. shocked. He went out and said it. So it's clear that this whole deal is off, and maybe you know he. Yeah, he was terribly naive, um, but he was looking for peace. He was looking for ceasefire for Hamas and an avoidance of a wider war. But, you know, at some point you have to realize, understand the kind of people that you're dealing with. And he was foolish. You know, we've been saying and many other people saying that that it's not going to happen because Israel has no interest, you know, in particular, the Netanyahu government has no interest in the ceasefire. Right. He the American understand. promise doesn't mean anything right. because America doesn't control Israel. That's the problem. And, right. and you know, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's another thing, too. It's, it's rather, it's really, I think, very, very naive on his part to think that they could make good on that promise, even if they wanted to. And I think they probably did. I think, you know, for domestic political reasons, it looks good to have a ceasefire and say yeah. that they brought it about. Yeah, I mean, America doesn't want this genocide in Gaza. It doesn't look good on them. But it's yeah. just so crazy that even though we have the ability to stop it, we won't. Yeah. Because right. So we are completely... APAC, right. So, so we, we our, our government... This is because of that. Yeah, I, I'm agree. I agree. I mean, it's not that they actually want it, but it's happening and they're complicit and they're supporting it. So they are guilty of it. Right, right. But it, right. It's, it's just such a strange thing because we obviously don't want it. And this is actually something from the Jerusalem Post um, that posted, they reported Lloyd Austin lost it with Gallant over the Nasrallah killing. That, Lloyd, that the Pentagon is absolutely furious because we weren't given prior warning and because of basically what he said. And they quoted saying, said the Israelis are doing this without consulting us and then ask we clean up when it comes to deterring Iran. Right. So it seems clear that that's what the U.S. position was. Say, Iran, just please, we don't want to get in. We don't want to fight you. Iran is like, good, we don't want to fight you either, America. Right. And Israel's like, hey, you guys fight. You guys fight. Yeah. Keep on keeping. You know, right. he's trying to poke the bear. Uh, on both sides, to to right. uh, even though it's clear that the U.S. doesn't want this, Iran doesn't want this, but Netanyahu is doing everything in his power to do it, and we keep right. on covering for it, and we, and so I'm just wondering, like, it seems at this point with tensions so high, a wider regional war is inevitable. Iran now has to do something, and I think everybody's waiting on it. Probably a lot of people in the sh the, the Muslim world, Shiite world, especially, are probably quite upset with Iran, saying like. Why yeah. weren't you helping Hezbollah? Why did you never uh, retaliate to the assassination of Ismail Haniya? And now at this point, they're going to have to do something. And it's clear that the U.S. doesn't want to either. So I'm wondering, one, there is going to be this clash between the U.S. and Iran. These are two powers that don't really want to fight each other, but they're being forced into this conflict. Like, I how, so. right. Yeah, I, I just wonder, like, th that's has that really happened before where you have these two powers that really don't want to fight and they're being forced into it. Like how big of a fight will it be if they don't want to do it? I, I guess you can say though, I mean, you look at world war one, you had all those people, the Russian czar, the Kaiser Wilhelm and in uh, the UK, they were all cousins and they were writing letters to each other before and said, you know, let's mm -hmm. hope war doesn't happen. And then boom. So it, it could, it could just spire out of control. Even yeah. though oh, it's yeah. clear these two powers don't want to fight. Right. Um, yeah. Well, right. I, I saw that same story about Lloyd Austin, and I think it's probably correct. But then the important thing also shows 
okay, again, you know, what we've been saying all along that Israel is trying, you know, all these, these assassinations have, well, they, you know, they, they, they do aim to weaken Hezbollah. There's no question about it. And they have by taking out a good portion of their leadership, but they're also doing it. And I, I think especially this Nasrallah assassination was done um, in large part, uh, you know, if, if not mainly um, in order to to finally bring about an Iranian retaliation, which they hope they can. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, which they hope to, you know, to um, use that to to ignite this war, you know, be, which would be first between Israel. Well, certainly Israel um, between Israel and Iran, but then um, as at some point will uh, will inevitably involve the U.S. For the Iranians, is this assassination of uh, Nasrallah, is that more significant than the assassination of Ismail Haniya in Tehran? Do you think this is, uh, you know, that... It might be, you know, it's just... Um, well, of course, you know, that the, the uh, Haniya assassination took place on the day of of um of uh, Khan's inauguration right and it took place on Iranian territory so there's that um but Nasrallah is a much better known uh figure within Iran and I again just say throughout the Muslim world um so I think it may be even bigger right and it's especially easy. since it's See, taken it and also, you know, this is not just a single event. This is the kind of the culmination of a couple of weeks of carnage, starting off with a pager attacks, and then it's, you know, one assassination after another, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of civilian casualties. You know, we don't know how many civilians were killed in this one strike. By the way, they like the I think the the uh, last I saw, the Lebanese uh, Ministry of Public Health said that they they um, that they had counted eleven. Uh, but clearly, clearly, it's a lot more than that. It's just that there are there, six high rise buildings. Yeah, collapsed. that's right. So, sometimes I they mean, say four, sometimes they say six. But either way, there just have to be dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of civilians that were killed in this attack. And so anyway, yeah. it's just on top of it. It's just, you know, it's all of it together. It's just it's just sort of a crescendo of savagery, at, right. you know, directed at a very close ally of Iran. I I. I, you know, we, we've talked about the provocations. This is just, this is beyond a provocation. Um, and I, I think mm -hmm. it seems clear that, that Iran has to, at this point, respond. Right. Yeah, yeah no, if you just, I mean, if you just take a step back and take a look at it. I mean, just, okay, I, I, Israel bombs the Iranian embassy in Damascus, right? And, and kills the Iranian general there. Okay. And then... The U.S. Yeah, and, and other and, Iranian officers. It will, and I, I think there were a dozen of them. Okay, a dozen Iranians hit Iranian soil in Damascus. Then the U.S. and Iran communicate and say, look, we really don't want to go to war, but clearly this is a big attack on our soil, on our embassy. This is the definition of an act of war. Okay, so they plan something. They do a retaliation. Don't kill a single um, Israeli, but they demonstrate and try to appease their people to avoid conflict. That was that retaliation. Right. Then Israel assassinates Hadiyah in the capital of Tehran during the inauguration of the new right. Iranian right. president, where the so Iranian it was, president... Yeah, right. It was, it was a deliberate provocation. I mean, right. It's the it's fact just, that they did it on the day of the inauguration. You know, this was something which you can see that it was directed at Iran and it meant to provoke them. Right, right. But so it's this provocation after provocation, you right. know, and, and and then now this one now, you know, carpet bombing Beirut now. I mean, the, 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 I mean, we had the initial killing of, of uh, Nasrallah on Friday, um, but then that was just the beginning. They've been bombing Beirut nonstop since then. Um, and, and it's just when people are going to step back and look at it, who can say that Israel is not provoking this war that wants this war. It's like mm -hmm. if anybody's looking at it objectively, I mean, even just passively looking right. at it, you know, how could you not come to that conclusion that yeah. that this is something that clearly I, Israel is just wanting conflict, wanting war. They don't seem to be interested in diplomacy at all. And if you're any Arab nation around there, you know, just ask Israel, like, well, what is it that you want? 
what it's clear that you you just want war. What what is it that you want to do? You you, you just right. want to keep on bombing the people in Gaza nonstop. Just say, can we get to some you know diplomacy, some type of resolution here that doesn't involve conflict? You start bombing uh, Lebanon. I just I, I just don't see how they're going to get the world on their side. Uh, oh no! Yeah, they have no intention of getting the world is. It, they've lost the world, you know. They still have the U.S. But, and incredibly, within the U.S., you know, it, 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 you know, we say it's obvious, but if you watch uh, mainstream news, you wouldn't think so. It was just spunky little Israel defending itself. Now, I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah, clearly, like actually, administration officials and you know, certainly the Pentagon actually do understand what Israel's doing. That's why Lloyd Austin got so angry. He knew what they were doing. And, you know, again, they do not want to be pulled into this war. But the incredible thing is that afterwards, he just went out and made a statement. Instead of criticizing Israel in any way, he says, you know, we stand by Israel. We're going to defend Israel and warned Iran. You yeah. Know, after, well, you know, they've already broken their promise to Iran, which we learned. And, um, you know, after this horrible, you know, a string of assassinations and, uh, you know, like it looks like the, an incipient genocide in, in Lebanon, the, you know, he has the nerve to go out and warn Iran not to escalate. You know, if you know, what is Israel doing if it's not escalation? You know, it's well, Iran has well, stayed there. You know, well, has, has, has pull, you know, has showed extraordinary restraint. Right. Right. But but what's what's wild is that, the, you know, what I quoted you before, this is the Jerusalem Post saying that Lloyd Austin lost it with Gallant and, and that. Lloyd Austin is saying that, you know, they're doing this without consulting us and asking us to pick up the pieces and deter Iran after this deliberate provocation. Mm -hmm. The truth is, so the Israeli media is more unbiased and open than it is in the United uh, States. Yeah, Why is well, that's, United uh, that's always been true. I mean, that's I remember that like 30 years ago, that you can actually get a lot uh, more, you know, uh, information out of out of uh, Israeli newspapers and other media outlets. Um, than you can from the U.S. I mean, we, there's more censorship about Israel than the, than there is within Israel. More censorship in the U.S. You know than in Israel. It's it's wild. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's when you go on social media, and especially if you look at Fox News or whatever, the, it's celebrations throughout all of the West, saying right. that you know this is wow, Israel is just stunning victory. Um, and they destroyed this, killed this terrible terrorist, uh, Nasrallah, that he's an evil man, responsible. They say that he's responsible for the deaths of many Americans as well. Right. Is there I any truth to I this? Think, I think what they're referring to is, okay, there were attacks on um, American Marines during the 80s. Because following um, the Israeli invasion, actually, the U.S. sent some Marines into Lebanon. Mm. And... You know, I'm sorry, but I don't think you can call that terrorist because you're sending your soldiers onto foreign land and, you know, land occupied by your, you know, your uh, close ally. And if they get attacked, you shouldn't be surprised. It's not what you call terrorism. It's what you call resistance. And that's what happened. Right. So, yes, you know, a number of Americans, quite a few were killed in attacks carried out by yeah, you know, Shia, and you know, later I think we can say Hezbollah, and Nas Nasrallah may have been involved in that, but that's not terrorism. You know, they're not. Look, they're not bombing Americans in America. You're there in in um, in Lebanon as you know, a, a part of an occupation. You are going to be attacked. Right. Yeah. It was. I think the, what they're referring to is the 1983 Beirut bombing, Beirut bomb bombings, which killed a uh -huh. lot of. Uh, Marines. But like you said, that this was uh, right after the Israeli invasion in 1982. Uh, Nasrallah didn't come into power, like you said, in the 90s, yeah. so he wasn't even, right. he yeah. wasn't even if leading. He, you know, if he was around, he would have been a low-level commander. I don't know if he was actually active then or not. Right. So this this is one. Right. Hezbollah was one year old, just when it was yeah. formed. I don't think it even existed in 1983, to mm -hmm. be honest. But maybe some of the people who later became part of Hezbollah may have been involved. That's certainly possible. But again, right. that's just not... This, this is not terrorism you know or you're really stretching the definition of terrorism you know, in this case yeah well if you're able to label the whole organization the whole country yeah it's, oh, terrorists, yeah. it's easy so we understand how that works right right well the ad so this is um 
it's just it's just crazy then that we yeah well we, when I, I just wanted to add something you know you're talking about the celebratory response on part of some of the you know the western media you know to this mm -hmm. event it shows actually to the extent to which really um we have uh fallen you know how less civilized we are than we once were um uh, Back in the early 2000s, the, the Israeli assassinate, Israelis, um, they assassinated um, um, a Hamas leader. And in the course of that assassination, seven civilians died. And actually, George W. Bush, who was president at that time, criticized Israel, you know, because of those seven civilian casualties. And, you know, he wasn't roundly, I'm sure there were some, you know, uh, hotheads out there who criticize and call them anti-Semite. But in general, you know, this was this was something an American president could do without suffering any significant consequences. It was actually a presidential thing to do. Now, look where we are with this recent attack that, you know, it was on the heels of, you know, this genocide in Gaza and the hundreds and hundreds of civilians that had already been killed in uh, Lebanon. You know, there was this attack that took out Nasrallah. It killed him. Um, but it also killed clearly dozens and probably hundreds of civilians, and our president um, condoned it. You know, this, so this is how far America has fallen. Yeah, we've lost our sense of humanity. It's really, it's really something. I mean, we, Israel's been involved in many, many conflicts, many, many wars since its inception. I mean, its inception started with the Nakba. Um, but have we ever seen anything? At the level of rage and bloodshed, no, and nowhere near. like this. No, 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 no. I think this this took us all by surprise. I guess you no. Know, you again, uh, close observers of Israel could see that this there there was an ugly spirit in Israel that was becoming you know that was always there, but it was becoming increasingly obvious, and um, you know it's just the this this rhetoric, and this dehumanizing rhetoric was becoming increasingly common. But yet, I think all of us are surprised by the extent of this, the savagery you know, that Israel has displayed during this last year. Right. I mean, we, we you know, we the one thing that we mentioned is like, you know, we stopped talking about the West Bank when Gaza uh, started, the genocide of Gaza started happening. Now we stopped talking about Gaza because of what's happening in Lebanon. And then so all, all these places are getting forgotten, which is, I think, allowing, giving Israel just uh just the sense that they can do anything with impunity that yeah. like hey we just do we we create some massacre here we do whatever we want we kill these people and then we can just move to the next one they forget about what we're doing there we can continue killing them and we keep on giving them cover um but i want to talk a little bit about gossip because we haven't really talked about it in a while since everything that's been happening here um and and just just the, the sort of the, the definition of genocide because when you're when you want to talk about this, uh, what Israel's doing, and you use throughout the term genocide, people that support Israel will all automatically reject this term, no matter what, you know, because obviously if you say that Israel's, you think that Israel's carrying out a genocide, you can't support Israel. So the, there's, they have a, the people supporters of Israel, Israel, uh, Israel rationalize it somehow to say that this isn't a genocide. It, I, I know it's, I think the word is important if we're able mm -hmm. to, firmly apply that label and say you know that this is textbook genocide um then it will take a lot of power away from israel so first of all uh, is is what can we what's happening in gaza can we say with confidence that this is indeed a genocide uh the the answer is yes i mean i know genocide is a term that's thrown around a lot it's much abused it's applied to a lot of situations where it is not applicable there's no question about it but this is one case where it is clearly applicable. Um, you know, we hear the figure, I think we're close to 42,000. It's like the official number of people directly killed by the uh, Israeli attacks on Gaza. Um, now, it was a couple of months ago that The Lancet, and you know, a highly respected journal, uh, a medical journal based in England, um, did a... But well, uh, carried out a study, right? Where they, uh, I think the important thing is that they applied a well-established methodology, and that is that in any conflict, okay, there are the, the direct casualties, the people that are killed by bombs and bullets. 
Um, but there are always more indirect casualties, people who die because they ha don't have access to health care, people who die, you know, in wartime, people who die because um, they don't have shelter and, and so on and so forth. You know, just in general, the, the conditions that make life possible or, you know, that make um, that make for a healthy population become degraded during war wartime. And so you have a lot of indirect casualties due to disease or people who simply, um, yeah, can't be treated for, for various ailments or, or wounds that they suffer. Um, and they said that, you know, the, that the ratio historically has been for every direct death, there are from three to four to 15 indirect deaths. Now, all of these are due to the war. They ended up taking, I think, you know, a very conservative figure. First of all, they, they, this was a couple of months ago. So this was before we reached 40,000. It may have been 37,000 or something like that. And then they, um, and then, you know, they, they used, I think, like a, um, a multiplier of three or four, you know, so at the very low end. And I, and even with that, using, you know, these very, very, I think, absurdly conservative assumptions. And, and one other thing needs to point it out. It's just that the official count, you know, clearly it has to be an undercount because there are a lot of people that are under that rubble that may never be found or won't be found until, you know, many months or years later after the conflict ends, you know, their remains will be found. So the actual count has to be significantly higher. And then this multiplier that they use, I think too must be higher because in the, in this conflict, you know, we we're seeing um, a deliberate destruction of, of, uh, hum, of uh, Gaza's, medical facilities every single one of his hospitals has, has if, if if it hasn't been destroyed and i think nearly all of them have been completely destroyed you know that has been damaged um so they're almost in, that that medical support network has been almost entirely eliminated and and then also um yeah we talk about shelter and uh, there's the um the, 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 clearly you know civilians have been not just targeted, but they've been that that infrastructure that supports their lives is is being methodically destroyed. It has been destroyed. There's just very little left of it. So to choose a lower multiplier, I think, is absurd. It's got to be. I think it has to be closer to the fifteen. You know. Um, so if you if you I think to use more realistic numbers, you end up getting easily a quarter million, maybe a half million. Um, Palestinians that have died in Gaza. I don't think that is at all. I think that's actually a well-founded estimate. And so we hear people saying that, you know, maybe it's 250, maybe it's 500,000. And so I, that we're talking about already close to a quarter of the population hmm. of Gaza, which was at the beginning was a little bit over 2 million. So yes, this is a genocide. I just wonder when we, when it's all said and done, will we ever be able to look, reflect on what's happened and get, get a body count and realize the carnage. I mean, I just don't, it's just, I just don't know. It's just like, will people just kind of forget about this? Like, can, can, can people forget about something this big? I mean, what's happening? Yeah, right I don't think, blowing... I don't think they can forget about this, you know, but they may lie about it. And maybe, uh, you know, the spin machine is in overdrive already um, and it will continue. It's just as long as the, as the Zionists are in charge in, in the U.S., and clearly they are, you know, it, it will, you know, it will be um, forbidden, you know, for people who want to maintain respectability, people who want to maintain power to actually, you know, point out what's really happening and, and afterwards to point out, you know, what, what has happened. Oh, okay, so where we're at right now, do you think it's inevitable now that Iran is going to have to retaliate, that Iran is going to be dragged into this war and we're going to have a wide regional world war? Do you think that's going to happen? Iran is going to get involved now? Well, it certainly seems to be the case. Um, yeah, they could be involved in, 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 in one of two ways or both ways. <laughs> There's talk about actually putting together um, a, an army that would be made up in part of Iranians um to 
come to the aid of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. So that I think that's happening, or at least the, the you know the reports there say that that is happening as we speak. That this army is being assembled I, in I've Syria. I heard something about that as well. Right. That they were going to so be, that's I, I, one I, thing, and then of course there could be a missile attack on but, on some Israeli facilities. But the thing is, you know how this war is being conducted right now, it's just Israel bombing a country without air defense. So there isn't really, right. it's not really a war. It's just, yeah. it's just carnage. So like right. if you send in an army, will Israel yeah. deploy yeah. air defense systems to, uh, because Iran uh, clearly does. I mean, it has Russian air defense systems. We know that now. Um, could could air defense systems be sent to to Lebanon because that would change the game because once yeah. Israel doesn't have air superiority uh -huh. they can't fly their F16s and F35s and bomb cities what 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 are they going to do they're going to go on the ground and then we're going to see that okay Israel's going to be in trouble most likely yeah, yeah um, i haven't heard anything to that effect and i think it would be very hard to uh, to move in, you know, significant air defense assets at this point. I think they would be interdicted by, by Israel. Well, then, what what is what is an uh, Iranian army going to do? Yeah, well, I think it only can do something if, in fact, a uh, ground invasion occurs, and it it seems like it's quite possible that it will occur soon. I mean, I I, I think the um, the Israelis moved two more br brigades up there, and they've and they've declared that there is something now. The reports saying that this will be limited, you know, that's some sort of limited objective, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, now, there's a possibility, something that I hadn't thought about. You know, I was saying I was saying that it was impossible for Israel to create this buffer zone. This is one idea that they would do: is they move in and push the um, Hezbollah back north of the Litani River, and in that way, uh, create a buffer zone for northern Israel. Um, I think it would be just under, you know, if they were fighting a kind of a semi-civilized war, you know, as as they did in the past. But I think, you know, I, I think I've just maybe underestimated the, the, the savagery of Israel. I forgot about what they've done to Gaza. And it was, Chas Freeman pointed out, he said, well, they may just choose to give southern Lebanon, especially that, that strip, just north of Israel, the Gaza treatment, and just reduce it all to rubble, simply just pulverize all of it, and then move in. And maybe that's what they're going to do. I don't know. But that's not what they're talking about now. But we have to keep that in mind, at least down the road. That this, again, they have not shown any restraint. You know, they, they clearly don't care how many civilians they kill, kill. So if they just have to wipe out you know, the, 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 the southernmost part of Lebanon, in order to take it, I think they will. I think the U.S. will be dragged into this, and in what way? Because it seems like the U.S. obviously doesn't want to, but you know how Israel, we don't get to call the shots. We're just... Right, yeah, <laughs> so. right. Yeah, well, um, they could be, you know, again, I, I don't see them, the U.S. sending any ground troops. I think that would just be highly unpopular and probably not very helpful either. Uh, but they could, if, if for example, Israel's uh, air defense becomes depleted, there certainly can be an air defense role that, they, that the, the U.S. plays. That's certainly possible. Um, it seems like Israel really needs no help in just destroying things from the air in Lebanon. So I don't see really what, what role um, the U.S. would play. I don't think they, Israel has any need for more bombs. And I... <laughs> over, you know, more bombs in Lebanon. I, I just don't see that happening either. So most likely it would be an air defense role. That's 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 what I see. Was there some report about the Houthis striking some U.S. ships? Is, do you know if that's true? Uh, yeah, I that... heard that, right, they fired a number of missiles at uh, U.S. ships and they claimed to have hit one and you know the U.S. has denied, or at least you know they said there's no significant damage. I think there there may have been a hit, but it wasn't. Uh, the damage wasn't significant. Um, okay, so this is a big question. I don't know if you're really answered, but just what's what's going to happen next? What's what's coming? I mean, uh, it's hard to can, see you, this. You, I, can, you know, look, speak I, in vague terms if that's all you can do. But yeah, I mean, uh, well, or, yeah. 
I don't know. I just, I don't see an end to this, you know. Um, um, okay, well, you know, maybe you could look at the two extremes and say likely something in between or something completely different. You know, history is full of surprises. I think anybody who really predict, predicts the future with confidence, and especially in, um, at the beginning of a war is a fool. Um, okay, well, let's say that Israel and the US um, make a serious miscal miscalculation as the US and NATO clearly did in the case of Russia and Ukraine. Um, and they underestimate um, Iranian capabilities. Um, you know, their air defense um, interceptors are, are quickly become depleted. And, and Iran begins to press a real advantage. And the, the, the future of Israel really seems to be in doubt. And then, you know, in the meantime, uh, let's let's say the the ground forces become bogged down and begin to suffer defeats. The Israeli ground forces in in Lebanon begin to suffer defeats. Um, well, you know it's it's at that point we've talked about it. It's just that it, Israel, first of all, does, it, it, I, I think would show uh, no reluctance to actually use nuclear weapons if it felt that it, it, it's it's um, its its existence was at stake, and I think also that it's you know it's it it could actually set the bar very low for that because we see that already. It's just like if they they feel like they've completely lost a deterrent capability and that people don't you know their adversaries no longer fear them. I think they would find that to be an existential threat. I think they really could use nuclear weapons. You know, so this is one extreme. We'll just say that. The other is that, um, well, for example, Hezbollah fails to plug these holes and then Israel, these intelligence leak holes, and Israel continues to pummel the leadership. And also, you know, maybe they, they're they able to pinpoint with accuracy exactly where um, 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 Hezbollah missiles are being stored, for example, and they do manage to destroy a lot of them to destroy launchers. And, you know, maybe they know exactly where the tunnels are. Maybe their intelligence is you know, on Hezbollah is, you know, vastly superior to what it, what it, what it was in, in Gaza. And they are able to do real damage. They're able to, to defeat Hezbollah. You know, that's not impossible either. Let's, let's be honest. You know, again, it's just, I think we're all surprised by the, the degree to which Israel had infiltrated Hezbollah. And then maybe that's going to continue to give them a large advantage. Um, and Iran, you know, it, it, it turns out either it doesn't have the, the resolve or the capabilities to do any significant damage to Israel. They do something. But Israel hits back hard, and and um, Iran um, simply pulls out. That could happen too, and it would be a, a victory for for Israel and the United States. You know, that's those are the two extremes. Um, now, likely it's going to be something in the middle. It's going to be a longer war of attrition, and I think if it turns into a longer war of attrition, it begins to favor actually um, the axis of resistance in this case. Okay, in the scenario where Israel defeats Hezbollah, but do you think that Israel will will stop? That it will lay down its arms? Because I feel like Israel is in this bloodlust right now, yeah. and it doesn't seem to be able to stop. It has no desire to stop. It doesn't seem to want peace. Right. It seems like they see this as their opportunity to, to take Gaza, to take the West Bank. Maybe occupy, take more, or go into Syria, yeah. take more of the Golan Heights, take take yeah. Lebanon. Um, it just doesn't seem like. I feel like maybe they see this as their chance to achieve that greater Israel. Right, right. Yeah, they and actually have. See, that's a good point. I mean, they have an incentive um, to have a protracted war. Of course, one in which they're victorious. But if they can draw out this war, I think it probably gives them more opportunities to to expand the territory of Israel in in Gaza, in in the West Bank, and possibly even there in southern Lebanon. Right, but it just seems so foolish because 
Like, even if you did achieve it, how do you think you're going to hold that much land? You, there are not enough Israelis around, for one thing. And you're already, what, they've lost close to, like, 20% of the, the Jewish-Israeli population in, in Israel. Um, you know, they, they it just not, I just don't see it. I don't think it's possible, right? I mean, even if you do take it, then what? You're going to build a massive wall around everything and just continue to beat everybody into submission i just don't yeah, understand well, yeah well that i think that i mean clearly that's their policy i mean that's the, the that's what they are aiming at and and they're again they're assuming that they're just going to have unlimited back backing from you know the world's superpower the u.s and that they can kick they can achieve this mm -hmm. um and maybe they can you know i hate to say that i don't want this to happen it's horrible but maybe they can I just seems so hard to believe because I mean, first of all, we're in the middle of a global transition of power. Yeah, you know, the U.S. is no right. longer the hegemon. Right. Um, you know, yeah. Russia. I mean, said, if they, if again, if they do achieve this, I mean, they again, as we have said many times already, uh, Israel really has suffered because of what they've done. That yeah, you know, they're um, they're standing in the world their moral standing is, is well it's completely gone they're the world's pariah they're hated around the world everywhere outside of uh, you know the u.s and a few western nations they're just they're hated um and um so the, you know there's that and that has consequences you can't simply ignore ignore that you know um and and there's economic consequences there's, the economy is contracted by something 20 percent and I don't think it's ever going to recover. It's never going to be, again, like we've said before, investors are never going to look at Israel in the same way that they looked before. Um, so it has taken a hit, even if they do succeed militarily and they do expand their territory and they do build this wall. You know, it's this is going to be a different Israel. And it's it, it's you know, they, they may win this battle, but I think they, they've actually weakened themselves in the long run. And. Meanwhile, as you know, you just mentioned the the global balance of power is shifting against the West. You know, this is something that, of course, we've talked about much, and especially in reference to Ukraine. But it has clear implications here. I mean, that um, the the adversaries of Israel in the West are growing stronger. They I, and the U.S. I believe is on a, and most Americans agree is on a downward path. So this is maybe the time, you know, I think this is part of the reason that Netanyahu is going for broke, that he sees that this is maybe the last time where he really has the edge, where he might be able to pull this off. Because yeah, 10 years from now, it's not going to be possible. Well, you yeah, have well, this fortress Israel, but maybe 10 years from now, you know, with this, he's a technology he's developed and, and uh, America, you know, becomes enmeshed in its, or con begins to you know we've already seen you know, like what's happened in the red sea um has is he continues to lose it its its advantage it will be in a much weaker position israel will be yeah i mean even if they do achieve it it just doesn't seem like something that they could hold for very long you know yeah. i just i just don't understand it, it seems like I, I i wonder that i'm like does netanyahu really have a plan i mean what's the plan when yeah well, when does it when it ends? What do you expect that everyone's like, yeah. okay, good job, you you <laughs> right. destroyed, killed millions of people, and took right. huge swaths of land. Well, he's going to good be, on you. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, if he actually succeeds and he wins this war, it can save his career. He'll be popular. He'll imagine himself as going, you know, going down in history as like the savior of Israel, like one of the great men of Israel. You know, there with Ben Gurion or even King David or something. You know that that's what he's imagining. I think, you know, and it's, it's um, but I, I, so within Israel, it probably makes sense, you know, you know, you understand like these people, when you observe their behaviors, we see them from the outside, but they live within these, these bubbles. And uh, he doesn't really care what, what the rest of the world thinks, you know, for them, it's almost like a validation. It's like, oh, the world hates us. It's just like, you know, like the early 1930s all over again. And this time we're not going to. Uh, you know, we're not going to show Never any mercy, right? Again. Exactly. So we'll just kill them all, you know, kill all our enemies. We're not going to show any mercy. And I, th I think that's actually a very common and, um, you know, 
uh, a deeply entrenched way of thinking within Israel, not just but, within the you know within the Netanyahu government, but throughout throughout Israeli society. I, I just wonder, will the world stand by and let it happen, though? I mean, we so got far, the immediate... So, yeah, so far they have. I mean, right. the, I mean the, 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 you can say the two exceptions are the Houthis and Hez, Hezbollah. Yeah, right, right. The Houthis, they're, they're yeah, the ones indirectly that... Indirectly Iran, I mean, because Iran is, you know, supports both of them. Right, but, that, but I mean, I wonder, like, as it starts to expand... Like if they start to roll further into the West Bank, yeah. they start going. Then right. you got you got Jordan that's going to erupt. You got Egypt right. that's going exactly. to erupt. Turkey's well, they are taking that risk. Like, you know, the farther they push it, you know, the the greater the chance that they're going to lose um, this these uh, comfortable arrangements they have with neighboring countries like like Jordan, like Egypt, and and Turkey too. You know, of course, uh, Erdogan is. Uh, you know, he. he he gives those fiery speeches, but he does have a comfortable economic arrangement with Israel. But at some point, Erdogan himself may just calculate. He say, you know, and it, it, you know, this no longer makes sense to to have anything to do with these people, and he could turn on them too. They, they're running that risk. The farther they go, you know, the the more likely they're going to start um, creating new enemies right on their borders, and then they, you know, yeah, that that will add. That will accelerate the shift in in balance of power, a, a shift against them. Um, I don't know if you saw this news, but you know there is the upcoming uh, BRICS summit in Kazan, and they will be adding twelve new countries to BRICS this time, and some pretty big players like Nigeria, Indonesia, uh, Venezuela. You know, a lot of oil, huge populated, mm -hmm. populated countries. Indonesia, I believe, is the fourth largest country in the world in terms of population. Um, but also surprisingly in that list is Palestine. Did you see that? No, actually I didn't. So Palestine is supposed to be added to the added to BRICS. Huh. I know it's a you know it's more of a economic arrangement than right. it's not a military alliance. But I I I think that carries some significance. It just yeah. shows that the we're we're moving into this new paradigm shift where we're going to have of the multipolar world and these new regional hegemons like Russia and China. Um, there is not going to be a global hegemon like the United States. And in that corner with these huge powers like Russia and China, Palestine is now part of that group. Yeah, so, right. Well, I think that's probably more of a political statement than anything. Right. But yeah, it is a significant political statement. It just it shows where, the, where they stand. Right. Where this new, kind of, right. This is the, the emerging going. power. You know, this is what's going to replace G20 and G7. And they, you know, whereas G20, G7 in particular has always stood very firmly with Israel, this new and this rising, um, not exactly, not, not alliance, but um, uh, grouping of world powers is, is on the other side of the conflict. Right. And after the addition of these 12 countries, the, the, the BRICS will now comprise 46% of the world population. I think something like 36, 37 percent of GDP. But once again, we said that GDP doesn't really matter. If we look at terms of manufacturing power, capacity, it's right. in manufacturing PPP capacity. terms, yeah. Yeah. Plus, or, or if you look at it in PPP terms or, or, or in terms of energy production in oil or whatever, the, the BRICS has the vast majority of that now. So the, it is showing that the world is moving this way and the world is saying that we need to recognize Palestine. What Israel is doing is not OK. Um, these are just political moves. There aren't many nations that are standing up and willing to be engaged uh, militarily against the, Israel or the United States. But um, that is, I think it's changing. Um, and I just feel like at some point, I think, like you said, we, we, we both agree, Iran is going to have to react at this point. Um, and once that happens, I think we're going to see a new phase. All the celebration in the West about how awesome Israel is, don't celebrate so early. This this is not, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. this this war is just starting to kick off. Right. The, the right. wider regional war. Yeah, you're, you're the Israel's going for the shock and awe. They've done a ton of damage to Hezbollah. They're massacring Beirut, but they are further isolating themselves in the world. They will draw in other regional powers. Iran will come in. I don't believe Jordan and uh, Egypt, uh, these other Arab nations, are going to sit on the sidelines for much longer once this erupts. And then the question is, what is the U.S. going to do? Do because we don't want to get in this war. And it seems clear 
The Pentagon is upset, is furious, is, is the word that the Jerusalem Post used. Yeah. Um, we don't want to get involved. This. Yeah, we have our but hands it, tied. Of course, it doesn't prevent them from supplying all the the weapons. And, yeah, you but, know, that's, the, but we can see how much our munitions we have. We supply, you know, I just saw yeah. we did another arms package to Taiwan. We, we, we're stretched thin. We, we can't yeah. uh, supply our proxy in Ukraine with enough weapons. Um, you know, at some point, and, and it may be sooner rather than later, we'll see what happens that the U.S. doesn't want this fight. Yeah, and well, how far right. will they go in? I just really hope we <laughs> yeah. don't get dragged in. Like, are they yeah. going to do a draft and try to get us? I mean, and, and then we have Russia right. that's ally that is forming yeah. a mil more than just an economic alliance with Iran. It is now a military alliance as well with yeah. Iran. And we want yeah. to get in. We want to touch not quite officially. They're going to be signing some sort of treaty, I think, with a, a couple of weeks from now, is my understanding. And, um, you know, we'll see the details of, of that at the time right. you know maybe it will be a formal alliance we'll see but it, obviously they have there there's very close military co cooperation between the two countries right now right and, and and of course they're getting it with china as well is is in that corner you know right. maybe they don't have any formal alliance but obviously they will be aiding and you know china can produce everything at uh, incredible speeds and incredible quantities so it's just it just it doesn't bode well, I think, in the long run. I just don't see this uh, not exploding and us being on the wrong side. And <laughs> yeah, well, we're already on the yeah we're on the wrong side, and we will be drawn into it. Yeah, I know. There's like uh, how far will it go? Private, uh, you know, this is not the first time we've heard reports about uh, U.S. officials um, uh, expressing their outrage at at Israel. I mean, this is actually this even prior to October 7th, there's you, you hear these reports periodically, but Israel, Israel knows that, you know, they've, they've probably heard, received these lectures and they've had people shouting at them over the phone, you know, again and again, but it, they see it never makes any difference because when push comes to shove, they get what they want. And then we just saw it with, again, with Lloyd Austin. Yeah. Okay. He probably did shout at the guy over the phone. He probably was truly outraged, but then then he went out in front of the podium and said, you know, we stand by Israel and and warned Iran, you know, which they've already, you know, failed and lied to and has just shown remarkable restraint, but warned them, you know, against escalation. I mean, the, the you know, the, the double standard is breathtaking. OK, well, we'll just sit with a bated breath to see the next move. But yeah, it's a very... Scary. And I have to say that, you know, there are times like there a lot of times we talk about it and it's almost just sort of intellectually interesting, all these topics. But it, occasionally it really comes home and you feel like, you know, the horror of what's happening and the real danger. And I really felt it this last weekend. I, you know, I was really just down just thinking about what Lebanon was going through, the people there. Um, and... Uh, yeah, th th this is, yeah, you know, this is not just an interesting topic for discussion. You know, we are talking about many lives. A lot of lives are being destroyed. People uh, in Lebanon, you know, many have been killed already. And there are, you know, usually, I think, already a million refugees. Yeah, I mean, there are parts of Beirut that are, I think are quite cosmopolitan. I mean, yeah, you know, my brother, your son uh, lived in Beirut for a while. You know, it's... Uh... It's, it's yeah it's just, these places are real that's the problem i think so many people have is they just that that haven't traveled the world that haven't been to these regions it, it makes it easy to demonize it and it's just like some fantasy book that they're reading and they're like yeah. oh it's cool you know they can they can rationalize it very easily in their mind once you you go to these places and these are real people and they're very nice people and and they're being massacred um yeah it's horrific it truly is Okay, Dad. Well, um, let's end it there. Okay. okay. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>